great to see everybody here. Um, it's nice to be able to get to see old friends and colleagues again. And our residents as well. You know, more what we have. Three stories worth of wire hose seems like a lot, doesn't it? Anybody wants to talk to Tom or I about what that looks like? That's another sort of energy sustainable technology that sort of is great but works against us. It also burns the grass in my yard. So I'm going to give you an overview and I'm going to be talking about strange things. Um, well, the layers of our protection, that, that's not strange, but it's part of the context. I'm going to tell you about a contradiction that many of, you, of us have seen about blind spots. I think that's the main thing that I want to tell you today, blind spots, and the issue of sustainability. Um, sorry for the hand protection. It's just that I'm curing my finger. It might be uh, distracting, but I'm fine. A little bit about myself. It always helps to know the speaker to, in order to, rest, uh, to understand the rest of, this, uh, of the talk. I'm an engineer. I'm a scientist. So I'm both. It's, it's tough, it's this dual behavior. Um, I've trained as an engineer in Spain and the United States, and as a scientist in the United States, and I've been working as a scientist in the UK, first in Edinburgh and now at MPL College for now 20 years. And I do believe in the importance of the two of them, not separated, but the two of them together. Um, specifically, the dream of my career, um, I'm, I'm not young anymore, and let's see how I'm doing, is, is, is to walk on this, right? To protect people, the environment, and homes from fire. <laughs> and, but it's starting really, really at the fundamentals of science. So when you go to the fundamentals of science, fire actually doesn't have one root. It has multiple roots. In particular, it has the physics root, fluid mechanics, heat transfer, and it has the chemistry root. And, and obviously, I feel very comfortable as a mechanical engineer in this route, but I cannot uh, negate the importance of the other one. And then as you go up into scale, away from the fundamentals into the apply, the, actually the two roots meet, the physics and the chemistry meet, and, and you start going from tiny little flames, which is a lot of fun to study little flames in the lab. Uh, that's not very useful to larger flames outside the lab, and then you end up with uh, the real fires. So this is, this is what I been wanted to do for the last 25 years, and I want to do for the next 20 years, if, if I'm allowed. Um, and then two more things for the context, and then I tell you what I wanted to tell you today. Something that you know is tremendously useful to <coughs> explain to people who are not fine engineers, to explain to them that uh, we can bring safety into a building, into a system, by these layers of protection. You know this, but we, we don't talk about it very often. What I've seen is this really works to explain this to people who are not fine engineers. I also think there is value in, in, in having this uh, among us. So it's just a refresher. This is the fire, this is the hazard, and, and that on the other side is people, property, and the environment. And we want to avoid the hazard to reach the people uh, in, in, you know, in quantity and intensity. So we pull all these layers in between. None of these layers is perfect. No one, no human, no engineer has invented a perfect layer. So all these layers have flaws, inconsistencies, issues. Some of them have a lot of issues. Some of them have a few issues. So that's why it's so important, this Swiss cheese analogy of packing all these layers together because none of them is perfect. And hopefully all the layers, one layer, some layers, will stop the hazard at some point. Right? What is the single most important layer? By far the most important, the first one that we call is prevention. If we have failure prevention, the fire is happening already, we have, it is a fire, there is a hazard developing, we have to detect it so we can do something with it. Early detection, not late detection. Late detection is easy, early detection. Uh, then we have to do something with it. We have to make sure that it doesn't go. The smoke and the fire doesn't go to other rooms. Compartmentation is such an important British layer for protection. In the US, they don't do too much compartmentation. They do something else. Then we actually have to suppress with a sprinkler, with handheld, or maybe the fire brigade. We obviously prefer the early suppression, but any suppression. The Americans love suppression. They love sprinklers. In the UK, the sprinkler is a layer that is called upon less often. Both countries, the combination at the end, have the best protection systems, but putting the emphasis in different layers. And obviously, we have to evacuate. Uh, sometimes evacuation can go at the end, or it can go in the middle. If it's a small house, probably it goes uh, 
at the beginning, we evacuate soon, but if it's a high-rise building, we cannot evacuate the whole building at once just because there has been a fire, and maybe the strategy requires evacuation more towards the end. And evacuation is very important because this is when we move people away from harm. So layers of fire protection. You know this, obviously you know this, but it's, I'm gonna call upon this later on. Examples, this is one example of a sad fire. This happened in 2013. Um, in, in Chechenia, in Grafnik, uh, this was, when we saw it, this was weird. It was spectacular and weird. Why is that building burning, right? Some people knew, oh yeah, yeah, it's a facade, it's flammable, I know. Um, I remember seeing this and I thought, this is, uh, this is weird. I, I don't think I've seen this uh, often at all. And you can see the layers of protection that were breached. Obviously, prevention was breached. There was a fire. Um, it was detected quite late, so that's a breach in detection. Uh, it was not compartmentalized. It's spreading uh, upwards and downwards and laterally, so major breach of compartmentation. It was not suppressed. It was more like burnout. And, and I'm not sure about evacuation. I'm not sure, I'm not sure the tower was occupied at the time that it happened. So a pretty bad failure. I think there was no loss of life, but obviously there was a big loss of, of business. The insurance bill was quite significant. So you can then analyze fires by looking into which ledges were breached, when, and what was the importance of that. Um, and this is important, right, because some people say, well, they were breached maybe because the regulations uh, were not complied with. And when we talk about the role of regulations and why the ledgers can be so extensive and all of them are imperfect and yet fires still happen, I would like to quote Professor Brannigan from Maryland. He was talking about the Titanic. He's very well known in fire, but in this case, he was talking about the Titanic. So we know what happened to the Titanic. And he complies, he says, the Titanic comply with the codes of the time. It was not an illegal ship at all. It was very legal. Lawyers can make any device legal. Only engineers can make them safe. So the Titanic was a legal ship. It was not safe. And we know uh, how it developed in the first uh, trip. So I like this to make the difference between having a building that is legal um, having a, a building that is safe, unfortunately, it's not the same. We, we like to assume that it's the same, but it's not the same. So meeting the regulations not automatically means that the building is, is safe. Why? Because the regulations are the minimum level of safety. They are the safety net of safety of the built environment. It's, it's low. It's low on purpose because if you are below this, it's actually a breach of, of the law. Uh, but there is plenty of room above it. Now, who is going to be asking us to populate buildings above the regulation, who is going to pay for the extra cost and the extra effort that means to bring the extra safety? Well, that, that is definitely a big issue and a big discussion for fire engineering, but it's very important to, to understand that if we aim at the regulation, which is the minimum, and there is uncertainty in what we're doing, then we are gonna be sometimes, unfortunately, below the minimal level of safety. And the Titanic is a, is a good example of, we thought meeting the regulations was going to make it safe. It was not, because the Titanic was facing, it was a new technology. It was an innovation. And this is a little drawing of the quote that a journalist did, right? So this is the lawyer and the engineer working together, and the Titanic fate uh, will develop later on. Now, we engineers, so imagine that there are no regulations. Imagine that there is no minimum safety. And imagine that there is really a market for safety. I know it is not, but imagine that someone says, I prefer to build one of these buildings to be the safest that I can, uh, as opposed to the most beautiful or the most innovative or the most pretty or the, most, or the healthiest. Imagine that they say, no, no, this is uh, safety is what we pay for. So then the fire engineer will be super happy saying, I know I, I, I can do this. So I thought, what would the fire engineer would do? What would be the natural examples, the examples that we know that exist? So where are the safest buildings that you can think of, I can think of. I call them fire utopias. You will see why utopias. So the best is suppression. I think it will be the igloo. If you have a fire in an igloo, it automatically melts water on top of it. It's like you have a super distributed sprinkler system all there. It is part of the fabric of the building. What I say, I wonder what are the statistics of fires in igloos. I bet they are very small and they are very, always very small fires. Now, how many people want to live in an igloo? Not just an experience one day with the kids. How many of us really want to live in an igloo? I, I, I'm from Spain, so I, I, will, I will die in an igloo. Um, <laughs> so you see, it's a, it's a fire utopia, because it's very safe, but no one wants to live there. There are more. 
what is the best in fire resistance? So when I was in Edinburgh, I was working a lot with Holly, actually, uh, on, the, on fire resistance of buildings, concrete, steel, and now in timber. So what is the building that there is no way the fire is going to put down? Bunkers. They were invented a long time ago, <laughs> at the same time as, as guns, and they are extremely resilient to the point that you have the battlefront going through and the bunker is still there, unless something strange has happened. Now, how many of you want to live in a bunker? There's absolutely no fuel inside, there is no commodities, there is no chairs, there is just very thick, cold concrete. And then the other one, this might, you might want to live in this one, but I don't think we can afford it, is the International Space Station. So I, when I was in California doing my PhD, I actually had the joy to work with NASA. NASA was very concerned about a fire in the International Space Station or in a space shuttle, because they have oxygen for the astronauts. So fires can happen, and they're full of polymers. Uh, but NASA has one of, no, no one, no, the stringest um, restrictions for flammability of what you put in a spacecraft. They love polymers because they're very light, but they are by far the safest polymers you can think of. So being a spacecraft, it is the safest environment that I can think of. Now, very expensive, and I don't think we can afford it, right? This is a price tag that, uh, so I don't want to be in any glue, I don't want to be in a bunker, and I cannot afford the International Space Station. But this would be, if a fire engineer has no limit in what to come out with in safety, probably end up like this. So there are five utopias. So fire engineers are not going to design by themselves the buildings. They're going to be part of a team. They're going to work with the architect for good and for bad, and they're going to be working with the other fire engineers, and together they're going to come up with the beautiful environment that we have. And that was the context. Now, this is what I want to tell you. I want to tell you about this contradiction that I've been seeing for the last 20 years. There is a narrative about fire safety engineering in the whole world, not just in the UK or in, in, in Europe. It is in the whole world. And you can choose. You have already chosen. I choose, depending on the audience, which narrative I want to run. I can have narrative, narrative A, we're all going to die, or I can choose narrative B, we're doing just fine. And I find, as a scientist, able to choose the data, hardcore scientific evidence, to support my narrative. But then when I realized myself that I was doing this, I realized, actually, there is evidence to prove that it is not true that we are going to die. It is not true that we are doing just in fine. We are doing well, but we wouldn't do better. And probably we are not going to be in a catastrophic situation. So why do people say we are all going to die? They use graphs like this. This graph is millions of tons of plastic consumed in the planet Earth. Obviously, the plastic goes to be next to humans. We don't send it to space. Um, and this is when the plastic industry was invented. And you can see it's an exponential growth. Exponential growth. We have an exponential amount, increasing amount of plastic around us. All plastics are flammable. There is not one single plastic that is not flammable, that have degrees of flammability. Even wood, uh, plastic by nature, a polymer by nature, uh, has flammability. Some of them are very flammable, so flammable they are forbidden to be next to humans. Uh, some of them are less flammable, but they all have flammability. So when a graph like this puts everybody very nervous. You can do a survey of the amount of plastic that we have right now here in this conference compared to the amount of plastic we had 20 years ago in the same, well, not in the Excel because it didn't exist, in another venue of a conference. And you will see how the number of kilograms of plastics is, is going up around us incredibly. So people say, we are all going to die. But then, for example, you can use a graph like narrative B. We are doing just fine which is data that we extracted from the London Fire Brigade. This is London, the Greater London, okay? And this is the number of fires per dwelling. So it's not adulterated by London growing all the time. The number of dwellings in London doesn't grow much fast, okay? So these are the number of fires that are happening in houses per, per house. And this is years from the year 2009 to the year 2020 when we stopped. And this is an incredible downward slope. So that's good news. So when you look into this, you say, well, London, the biggest city in the UK, one of the biggest cities in the world, is doing absolutely fine. Don't change it. Don't touch it. It's doing absolutely fine. Look what the statistics are telling you. Whatever they're doing, keep going because we have less and less, less fires. Obviously, less fires. You look into the data, can I show you? Book your tickets now for the 8th International Tall Building High Rise Fire Safety Conference, taking place alongside FDIC in Indianapolis, US on the 15th to the 17th of April, 2024. Three days of world-class speaker presentations, debates and networking. Book your tickets via the website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com. Early bird discount tickets will be available.
The tall and high-rise building fire safety management course is ideal for anyone who has responsibility for fire safety management in tall and high-rise buildings. It is a five-day intensive course with world-class instructors. You can get full details of the course on our website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com So, so do, can I uh, raise your hand? Can you raise your hands? Who, who supports narrative A? Who feels like I, I am a supporter of narrative A? We're all going to die. Or, or, or who supports narrative B? We're all doing fine. Right? So I actually vote for both. We, if we are not careful, we might end up ha being in trouble. And I don't think we're doing just fine. I think we, there is room for improvement. So the two of them. But I found myself going to different people. With, with, for example, when I ask for funding, I tip, as a fire scientist, I say <laughs> to the government. Right? But when I'm working with my colleagues and I tell them, don't, don't worry, keep doing it, I show them this. Right? <laughs> so the problem is blind spots. I mean, there are other problems. One of the problems is fire inequality. The statistics that I show you uh, of London, that's the average of the whole city. Not everybody, unfortunately, uh, has the same level of safety. There are pockets in London, there are pockets in every city that has more of a fire problem. So it's fire inequality. That's one of the first problems. When you look into statistics, you mask things. Fire inequality is one of them. The other one that we mask, by definition, when we look into statistics, is blind spots. Blind spots, by definition, I created this concept, innovation uh, blind spots for fire safety. It's things that we don't see. We, we don't see. OK, maybe he sees, maybe he sees, maybe one day I saw. That's not enough. It has to be collective agreement that something is happening. Because otherwise, there's not going to be an action. Um, this is London, the same data that I show you. This is the um, number of injuries in a fire. This is the number of fatalities in a fire. And each of those dots is a fire. It's a year in London of the last 10 years. And we started in 2019, and we are connecting the lines to see how amazing London is doing, except Grenfell Tower. So if you don't see Grenfell Tower, um, which is a black swan in this, in this behavior. This is such a beautiful story of London, okay, improving the safety, decreasing the number of fatalities, and decreasing the number of uh, injuries. So it's not only just decreasing the number of fires, it's literally decreasing everything, except Grenfell. So Grenfell becomes this black swan, this unexpected behavior that cannot be captured in a statistical analysis. So when we look into statistical analysis of a city or a, or a country, we will, by definition, will never see this kind of um, events, which now everybody's worried about, right? Um, this is what I call the transition from the blind spot, we don't see it, collective we, until now is the elephant in the room. Now absolutely everybody sees it. We might not be able to act because we don't know what to do. We are still unprepared, but everybody sees it. These are the number of fires, facade fires, since the 1990s, when I was a, a, a teenager, not even at the university yet until when we start collecting data about um, a few years ago. And you can see that the growth of facade fires is exponential. Yeah. The, the growth of facade fires is exponential. So facade fires now is not a blind spot, but it used to be a blind spot. No one was, no, we, we were not seeing it. Some people were seeing it, but we, we were not seeing it, right? And now with, unfortunately, with Grenfell Tower, um, the UK agrees that this is not a blind spot, and it has actually even identified what were the roles and the issues in the layers of protection, in the regulation, in the certification of materials, in, in dodgy behavior by many actors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But once upon a time, it was a blind spot. So do we have other blind spots? Facade fires would not be one, right? Because as fire engineers, we love architects, or not. I always say the dreams of the architects are the nightmares of the fire engineer. Um, so the build environment, fast or slow, is always going to be changing. This is good news. Change, I promise, is good. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching an age where maybe change is not as much fun as it was, but it is fine. Building exactly the same buildings all the time is not good. Uh, you go to a country where they only have one style of architecture, and you don't want to live there. You just want to get out. Um, so we are happy with the architects bringing new ideas, bringing innovation, bringing different materials, bringing different concepts, different ways of constructing and building. It is good and it's going to happen. Fire engineering has to catch up. Literally, the definition is we need to catch up. 
because we don't know what the architect is gonna come up with. We don't know what is the next material that is gonna be appearing in the market. So this is the definition of, this is the analysis of how blind spots appear. Innovation, it is going to be happening. In the built environment, in the transport networks, in the way I'm talking to you today, it is going to be changing, right? These innovations, a number of them, not all of them, but a significant number of them, bring hazards. And many of these hazards are related to fire. Um, and, and some of these hazards so these are with us already. I'm actually thinking of lithium-ion batteries. We have in this room a number of lithium-ion batteries of all sizes, which is incredible. So new hazards are with us. But this is not seen in the statistics yet. It is a new hazard. It is not seen in the statistics. When you look into the statistics, you are collecting everything that is happening. You don't see it there, right? Remember what happened with facades? At the beginning, it was this noise. No one will see it. If we don't see it, regulations and standards are not going to address it. There is no way a standard, such a specific document, is going to address a hazard that doesn't exist yet. It will be like blind people talking about what is the meaning of colors. So we don't have regulations. We don't have minimum. We don't have minimum. And we know that there is no market for the maximum. So we are going low, we are going really low with this new hazard. And because there is no statistics on this and there is no standards on this, we don't have a tool for it. So we, we find engineers are extremely smart and very resilient and innovative. But if we don't know what are we talking about, if no one has, has tell us about this, we don't have experience on the hazard, we, we are not going to address it because we don't, we don't have the tool to address it. We, I, I might talk to my colleagues and I might have an opinion and they might have another opinion, but the, the key in science and engineering is that we both know uh, the goodness of a solution depending on what we have learned together uh, with, with others. So this is what uh, blind spots um, are. Can you think of a few blind spots now? Can you think of some blind spots that maybe the topic today is going to be talking about? Because we have... We have fire safety and we have energy systems. Energy is always a source of innovation. It's such an important thing. And now maybe in the last few years, even more. So we have innovations coming from energy systems. Uh, we, have, we are propelling transport, propelling our systems, propelling our buildings. And we also have the green and the sustainability agenda, which is really important, right? Not to do buildings as we were doing them, no medieval castles, uh, no one care what happens after it's being built. Sustainability is taken into account at the time of being built, what would happen to the building afterwards, right? And what would happen to the exterior of the building. And they create hazards. They create, for example, uh, they, they bring hazards. I, I just want to talk to you about two because the rest of the speakers are gonna tell you about all the other ones, just very quickly. One is timber. We've been, timber, timber is novel, we, timber is, this, is the first material humans built with. When, when we were uh, nearly, ca right after being cavemen, you know, we, ca cave people, we were building uh, houses and little uh, places out of wood. They don't survive the fossil record because it's wood, uh, but obviously this was the first material we used to build. You go to Canada, you go to Scandinavia, they're building a lot of wood. So why are no what is the novelty? The novelty is that these are tall timber that these are significant size buildings made of timber. And timber is flammable. And we have, as engineers, not been asking ourselves often enough what to do with timber, what is the behavior of timber, how, does it, uh, how do you understand the flammability of timber, how do you address the hazard of timber through the layers, how you prevent it, how do you detect it, how do you compartmentalize it, how do you suppress it, how do you evacuate if it's a tall building that is made of timber. And the last layer, which I didn't mention before, is a structural collapse. If you have a timber building, it's very tall, and it's made of timber, and there is a fire, and it takes an hour to evacuate, and the structure is made of flammable material, you have a big question to answer there as a fire engineer. I am absolutely convinced the answer can be, the, the, the question can be answered. What I don't know is how. And, and why not? Because it needs time. It was not in the statistics, it was not in the regulation, and the solutions are not gonna appear until uh, we we'll discuss these things. Another one is the elephant in the room, definitely. This, this was a blind spot maybe five years ago, 10 years ago. Now it's on its way to be the elephant in the room. Now we can see them in the statistics. Now the London Fire Brigade for the last three years, four years, collects when it goes to a fire. Was this suspected to be initiated by a lithium ion battery? And now you put the data together and guess what? 
I bet one of the speakers is going to show it. It is going up, and it's not going up slowly, it's going up exponentially. I was this summer in Canada, in the beautiful city of Vancouver, giving a talk on battery fires, because that summer, last summer, it was the leading cause of fire death in the city of Vancouver, lithium-ion batteries. Leading cause of fire death. Obviously, the fire brigades had a lot of questions about this new technology that was everywhere. Scooters is the fashion of the last two years. Before, if you go to this table, these are all the fire hazards that we had in history uh, with batteries. A lot of cell phones. Now cell phones are doing fine because Samsung almost goes bankrupt for getting it wrong. And I think people started to think about this. Notebooks, computers, it didn't happen for a while. It was really good. Uh, some uh, companies almost, I think it was Sony, both bankrupt because the laptops were sitting on fire spontaneously without even abuse of them. Uh, electric vehicles, ongoing, aerospace, Boeing almost goes bankrupt when it uh, launched the, the, the airplane, uh, the Dreamliner. And, and now we, we are here, hoverboards with scooters. And the one that I worry, which most of you probably are thinking about, is the stationary energy storage systems. These are the biggest batteries ever built by humans, and they go inside the building. And because they are very ugly and no one wants to see them, they put them in the basement, and they put them next to the evacuation stairs. And I know what all you're thinking, and this is what I'm thinking, but when you talk to the engineer system that love this technology because it's going to make the grid stable and all these things, and you tell them you cannot put it in the basement. And they're like, why? No one wants to see it. And that's the ongoing conversation. It's not in the statistics. It's not in the standards. There is no safety network. We can go very low in safety, and we don't have the tools because it's a blind spot. So with this, I just want to finish. Conclusions is that we're doing well in fire engineering. We're doing the way definitely in the UK, but we can do better, and, and we will do better, almost guarantee, that this innovation that will always happen in our field is good. This innovation will bring hazards. Some of these hazards are already being discussed in this conference. We're talking about facades. I think today we still continue about talking facades. If, if the new material that is flammable is a natural polymer instead of being synthetic, it's called a green wall or a living wall. They are flammable. They are definitely flammable. I work on forest fires. Um, photovoltaic panels, another innovation that has some questions to be answered, and batteries, which you're going to have some talks. And what do they have in common? They have in common that it is a noble hazard, not captured, not seen in the statistics. Authorities are oblivious to this. It is not going to be addressed in regulations. There is no minimum safety being brought into, and there is no market for going to bring in safety if no one wants it. And there are no tools, and they need to be developed. And with this, I finish. Thank you very much. Book your tickets now for the 8th International Tall Building High Rise Fire Safety Conference taking place alongside FDIC in Indianapolis, US, on the 15th to the 17th of April, 2024. Three days of world-class speaker presentations, debates and networking. Book your tickets via the website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com. Early bird discount tickets will be available. The Tall and High Rise Building Fire Safety Management course is ideal for anyone who has responsibility for fire safety management in tall and high rise buildings. It is a five day intensive course with world class instructors. You can get full details of the course on our website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com.